The other question is, does everything um, go down in fasting? Not everything. Some things go down, some things go up. Things that we know go down in fasting are glucose uh, and insulin. We know that IGF-1, which is insulin growth factor 1, also associated with disease processes, also reduces during fasting. Leptin goes down, and that's associated with reduced inflammation. The blood pressure, the heart rate, and mTOR, which is mammalian target of rampamycin, goes down in fasting. And the lower your mTOR, the higher your autophagy. That may be the mechanism why fasting increases autophagy is because of its effect on mTOR. Uh, microbial loads, we already talked about rebooting the gut microbiome in the intestinal tract. There's a big reduction initially during fasting. And then after fasting, feeding a whole plant food diet, you end up growing back your diverse strain of bacteria that are associated with positive health results. Inflammatory markers, including IL-6 and TNL alpha and all kinds of other exotic markers that are being studied now tend to be reduced uh, with fasting uh, as is inflammation and oxidative damage in general. Fasting reduces all of the abnormalities that are associated with metabolic syndrome. It's the most effective way of getting people out of this syndrome that's making people vulnerable to disease and debility. So some things go up in fasting, adenopectin and ghrelin, and their increase is associated with improved insulin sensitivity and reduced inflammation. Um, some of the processes get complex, like AMPK, which is activated protein kinase, downregulates something called PGC1 alpha, which is peroxisome proliferator activated receptor. And that increases mitochondrial biogenesis. What does that mean? It means that the actual mitochondria, the energy producing components in the cells are enhanced during fasting. And that may be one of the reasons that we see these patients with chronic fatigue. And like right now we're treating a lot of um, long COVID where people had COVID, but they didn't fully recover and they've got brain fog and fatigue. And you fast those patients and remarkably enough, they recover. In fact, we have a fascinating uh, case report that will be coming out um, next month uh, that looks at a 40-day fast in a two-year history of long COVID uh, in an individual that had all kinds of detailed biomarkers before and after fasting. And uh, very interesting, uh, the changes that occur with fasting. Um, BDNF is brain-derived neurotrophic factor. That is a, an agent that protects the nerves in the brain from damage associated with you know, Alzheimer's disease and dementia. Uh, in fact, it was an interesting study that were done with rats where they put rats, uh, genetically bred rats in cages, identically fed, but one set of rats was given a wheel so it could exercise. And the ones that exercised didn't get Alzheimer's disease or dementia. And they wanted to know why. And they found out is because the exercise dramatically increases brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And it turns out that exercise prevents those rats from getting dementia. <clears throat> the other thing that increases um, brain-derived neurotrophic factor is fasting. <clears throat> Excuse me. And in fact, one of the things that's interesting is many of the things that improve with exercise also improve with fasting. And you might say, well, why would that be? With fasting, you're resting and exercise, you're vigorously active. What do fasting and exercise have in common? Well, what they have in common is they both help undo the consequence of dietary excess. Fasting and exercise both undo the consequence of dietary excess and dietary excess is, a, is what inhibits things like BDNF uh, and, and other variables. Well, the reason why BDNF goes up in fasting is because the higher your uh, beta-hydroxybutyrate, the higher your BDNF production and B, but beta-hydroxybutyrate is what the brain is burning during fasting. That's what your brain fuel uh, focuses on. Um, there's also cellular stress resistance and adaptation that improve in fasting. That was uh, demonstrated in the study with rats. They had 30 rats and two groups, identical in every way, and they, both, they all had cancer. And they gave the first group of rats enough chemotherapy to kill all the cancer cells. You have to kill all the cancer cells because otherwise the cancer grows back. But in killing all the cancer cells, you also kill all the rats because the toxicity from the chemotherapy. Took the same rats, the same cancer, the same chemotherapy, but this time did fasting before, during, and after the chemotherapeutic administration, and all 30 rats survive and dramatically enhancing cancer-free survival. Because what fasting did is it made the cancer cells more vulnerable to the effects of chemotherapy, but in the meantime, it protected the healthy cells from the damages of chemotherapy cellular stress resistance, and cellular stress adaptation. Uh, I mentioned Yoshinori Ashumi, who won the Nomal Prize in Medicine in 2016. That was for his work on autophagy, which we mentioned was enhanced uh, during fasting. 
and the gut microbiome diversity and, and, and the stimulation of B cell immunity. So these are some of the things that we're learning. Now, many of these papers have only been published in the last few years about why it is that for the last 40 years that we've been fasting people, we've been seeing people that are sick get well. According to Walter Longo, published in uh, Journal of Metabolism 2015, the combination of fasting and chemotherapy results in dramatically higher cancer-free survival than chemotherapy alone. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna have just enough time here to go through a couple uh, quick case reports, and then we'll have time, hopefully, to answer your questions. This was a paper that was published um, in uh, the British Medical Journal, uh, case reports in 2015. It was a water-only fasting in the treatment of stage three follicular lymphoma. This was a young woman that came to us, 42 years old, had been diagnosed and been tracked for two years with progressive lymph cancer. She'd been confirmed with excisional biopsy. She'd been tracked and um, well-documented uh, tumor masses. Um, despite the fact that her oncologist and her uh, doctor told her that diet didn't matter, she could eat whatever she wanted and that fasting was criminal quackery, she decided to come to the center, fasted for 21 days on water only, had a 10 day recovery during which time her palpable tumors completely disappeared. Um, she lost 22 pounds in that three week fast. Um, and at follow up, um, she had maintained and uh, lost an additional 13 pounds by following a whole plant food SOS free diet. She had a little bit of residual mild neutropenia. Her white count was slightly low. By six months, her white counts had normalized. She'd lost additional weight by maintaining the diet. And at 12 months, um, she had this follow up scan that showed a dramatic reduction uh, in her masses. She, uh, at this point, we wrote an article up on our experience with. Uh, fasting and follicular lymphoma. It was published by the British Medical Journal, but they asked us to follow her for three years because they said a small percentage of people spontaneously go into remission and we wanted to make sure it was sustained. And so we um, followed this patient uh, after this paper was published for three years and we're able to get a whole body CT. And I'm happy to say she was completely cancer free. And just a few weeks ago, we managed to get a six year follow up on this individual and she continues to be cancer-free. Now, since this was published, we've treated a large number of patients with follicular lymphoma, and uh, the results are extremely gratifying. In fact, we have a number that we're getting our follow-up CTs on uh, as we speak or that we've received them, and we plan to be publishing a cohort, go back to the British Medical Journal with a series of these patients, and hopefully that will help us justify a clinical trial, because we believe this is a condition that will respond um, well. Um, we had, uh, this was an interesting case published in 2016. This was a dentist who suffered a brain trauma, uh, had 16 uh, years of continuous uh, headache um, and uh, underwent uh, fasting for 41 days, followed by a six month period of refeeding and then another 40 day fast. Uh, post uh, fasting, this patient has now gone, this, this study, it said six years, but we, we have a follow up on her at eight years now with, uh, without any a residual cephalgia. We also were able to treat successfully a patient with subacute appendicitis that was told to go to surgery, but rather than do surgery, we did fasting. And I'm happy to say years later, he continues to have his appendix. Um, this was a case of hydronephrosis, urotectasis, and partial regression of an unspecified retroperitoneal mass. This individual had uh, been on a vegan diet uh, for a couple of years, but still had obesity and hypertension and hypothyroidism and had recently had intra-abdominal pain, which was discovered to be a mass. In order to determine whether the mass was a cancerous mass or fibrosis, they needed to do a biopsy, uh, but it's a delicate biopsy because of its location. Uh, there was a delay of 30 days before they could schedule that. And so during that time, we went through uh, medically supervised fasting. Uh, during the fast um, that lasted 13 days with 11 days of recovery, they dropped their weight from 105 kilograms to 98, their blood pressure normalized, and when we, they went back in for their follow-up CT, the mass had reduced to the point where there was nothing left to biopsy. So that was gratifying. This was a case of seborrheic keratosis, real simple. This was an individual um, who had a lesion on their face they didn't like, uh, and post-fasting that fell off during fasting, which often happens to various skin lesions. Uh, and this was the follow-up. Um, uh, 
there's a number of other studies. I want to uh, stop now so that we'll have time to take some questions. But I would tell you, for those of you who wanted to see the rest of our uh, published case reports and studies, that you can go to our, our website at fasting.org, which is the website of the uh, True North Health Foundation. And all of those are readily available. I also wanted to mention, if any of you are physicians and you'd like to do something worthwhile with your life and get a chance for once to see people get well, we do offer internship and residency training. There's no cost to the doctors. We provide room and board and training. Uh, and you, and particularly interested in people interested in research, great opportunity to do human subject research. You can come uh, to True North Health and uh, we have a 70 bed inpatient facility where we're uh, doing active uh, human subjects trials. Um, we have resources available uh, that are vegan SOS free cookbooks. If some of you are wondering how to cook without the salt or the oil, uh, those are readily available. And uh, you're welcome to uh, uh, contact me if you have any questions like, would fasting be appropriate for you? We offer a no cost phone conversation with me. You can go to our website, complete the registration forms at truenorthhealth.com. And then as I said, I'm happy to speak with you on the phone to help determine whether or not, whether it's True North Health Center or some other facility, we can refer you to a, a local facility that does fasting supervision. We'd be happy to help you with that. Mm -hmm.